Josh, how are you? Good. How are you guys? You're out in um, what? You're up. I forget. You're up north. Where are you? M Montana. Montana. Yes, I wanted yeah. to say Minnesota, but I knew that wasn't completely right. Yeah, just a um, couple to the left. Yeah, well, you know, up there, I always wanted to go to Montana. I need to get out there and see it. So anyway, oh, yeah, dude. Montana. Yeah. I am. Uh, I'm rambling. Um, before we get started and we go into Josh and everything that's awesome, you know, about Team Kaizen and, and what they're doing and where they're going, uh, just a note, with what happened to Dr. Disrespect yesterday, grow up, you know, this is not, there, people shouldn't be shooting into people's houses, you shouldn't be swatting people, you know, this is, this is real life, you know, his wife and his kids were home. It's just ridiculous that we're at a point where, you know, this stuff is happening. And I realize that, you know, this new wave of internet celebrity is just like, you know, any other celebrity. And there's always going to be crazies that come out of the woodwork, but we can prevent it, you know, just stop being asshats. Um, well, people get pissed off. Here's what I'm guessing happened. Dr. Disrespect in character pissed somebody off. And then that person is a little. And then they came after him. Yeah, that's what I'm guessing. And so they're just like, fuck you, Dr. Disrespect. And, uh, you know, th that's fucked up is what it and, is. And I think when you're, you know, if, if you are brought up in the culture of, or if you're, you know, you go through the usual channels of stardom, you know, be it music or movies or TV or whatever it is. I think you got to get an intro to this and people along the way go, okay. And by the way, you should get you a house that has a gate on it. And, you know, but you know, we're dealing with a whole new medium here, really. Right. So people, you know, you don't expect that. And, and people so, are just going to go, Oh, it's video games. It's video games cause this and that whole spiel. Yeah, exactly. So that's going to happen. Anyway, anyway, don't be a dumbass. That's the don't rule. Number this. one. Don't, don't be a be dumbass. A but, you know, yeah. that's our, that's our <laughs> discourse motto there. So anyway, Josh, welcome. Yeah, thank you Tell for having a, me. A little, all we, I mean, this is, you're doing a lot of what we're doing on, on your channel anyway. But so give us the, give us the back history. You all have a wonderful, you know, heartwarming and, and just fantastic backstory about how you came to be. So tell everybody who you are and what the company is and how you got here yeah absolutely and thanks again guys for having us and uh basically uh my brother trevor is six years younger than me we live with our mom cindy and we're the three co-founders of attitudes entertainment company uh we currently have two studios underneath us team kaizen is our for-profit studio and genium is our 501c3 non-profit studio and we're the first two playstation certified studios in montana how that all got started is uh, back in 2002, I had just graduated high school three months earlier and Trevor was going into seventh grade and a friend pressured him to try out for football. And they failed him on the physical three times over the course of the week and he had really crazy high blood pressure. I was looking to see if mom was here, she could give me the exact numbers. I can't remember the exact numbers they were at, but crazy high. And so it got to the point where we got the call where not only was he not allowed to you know, of course, to play football, but that we also had the emergency of he needed to be on blood pressure medicine right now by order of uh, Seattle's Children's Hospital and that he needed to be in emergency surgery by Friday. Jeez. So we, yeah. And so we found out that he, first of all, had a defect in his bladder, his bladder at the age of seventh grade ballooned over seven i mean over nine times the size it should have been and backed urine up into his kidneys which were basically on the verge of being poisoned to death and holy it, crap yeah and it started a whole chain of events christmas eve that year our father made the comment to trevor's face of do you know how much money you're gonna cost me and mom told him you know not a dime you know mf you know you know you're you're gone asshole kind of thing so he left and we had to go medically bankrupt. We lost everything, moved in with mom's parents. Uh, I started working a dead end job to help make ends meet because the way that like mom had worked in the group home system for 18 years where she was like a care a manager for a group home. 
And uh, Trevor's pediatrician flat out told her, if you want to save your child's life, you know, the way our healthcare system is in the U.S., you have to quit your job. You have to be below poverty line or he's going to die. That's uh -huh. your choices. So mom quit her job and I took a job to make ends meet. Like if you ever call a call center and get that, like this call may be monitored for quality assurance. I was the dude monitoring it and grading it like a test. And uh, I didn't know that's how they did that. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Like, we, yeah, we would listen in and grade calls there. God, there's an entire book you can write about that kind of stuff that <laughs> the, the amazing experiences we had on that like like what my favorite one one quick aside is that uh you know typical corporate bs kind of came down in that place and they got to the point where they wanted us to monitor more calls in a month that than were actually physically possible like actual time wise <laughs> and so uh one lady made it work by not at, like grading the call but not actually listening to it she graded a call for best buy corporate as exemplary customer service an example should be played for corporate so they decided to play it for corporate and they had best buy on the line listening to it as the rep starts screaming at the customer you stupid son of a and start <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was the best day ever <laughs> like we were just all like in dumbfounded shock like yeah that plan fell through let's try something different but um yeah so anyways you know a couple we did that for a couple years and it got to the point where we were in the waiting room during one of trevor's surgeries and like he's had over 70 we stopped counting at 70 you know but um so i told mom that normal wasn't working for us and that meant we had to try crazy and that meant taking our love of video games and turning into a job and before, when I was in high school, I had a friend that ran an indie game studio before the word indie was even around. And he ran a studio called Crucifix, and he had taught me the basics of, like, being a writer on a game team and kind of loosely about game design. But other than that, we didn't really have a lot of input yet. We were just kind of winging it. And our local business development authority found out, and a really awesome woman that we call our uh, Jedi Master, Rebecca Ingham, reached out to us. And she told us, if you guys are serious about this, I will teach you how to be entrepreneurs and how to pitch and how to present. And she took us under her wing and taught us. And then from there on out, we just started building a team. And we're now at the point where we have about 35 people on our team, although they're not all working at the same time because you know, they all have day jobs and stuff. So we all use resources like email and Trello to say, okay, here's where we're at at this project. Let's split this up. Okay, who has free time? Can you jump on this really quick and get this to the next point? So it's kind of like constantly running the, you know, the marathons or the pass and the baton right now. And it's been a really crazy ride because, you know, first we started with this idea of, oh, we want to develop a fighting game because several of us grew up in the 90s. We grew up with the crazy 3D fighting games that kind of died out, like Battle Arena Toshinden, Bloody Roar, Tobal Number no. 1, Urgies, Power Stone, all those ones that were a little more creative, a little more dynamic. And we wanted to do something that was our own variation of bringing that back. So we started working on a prototype that we call Shattered Soul. And as we were working on that, we were also kind of doing our own thing with reaching out to people in the game world. And I was hyped as hell for Little Big Planet when it got announced back in 2007. And when it got released, uh, Sony put a like posting on the PlayStation blog saying, hey, we're just looking for some players to see if they can create a level in Little Big Planet that teaches the concepts of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, which they now call STEAM. The A added in means art. Yes. Uh, Very uh, happy about that. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's absolutely necessary. But, um, and the thing with me is I'm a nut for rides and roller coasters, and I was already teaching myself how to build rides in Little Big Planet and teaching myself the engineering about it. And so I'm like, you know, what the heck? I could quickly throw this together, see if I win. It'd be fun. So uh, first of all, the water pack had just come out, and I wanted to get the trophy for uploading a level that was had water in it. So I put a flat level of water, flat plank across the top of it, and just put a bunch of rides with ride attendants explaining the different aspects of a ride, like G, uh, positive and negative G-forces, kinetic and potential energy. And it ended up with this thing where I all of a sudden got an email saying, congratulations, you're one of the grand prize winners. You're getting a $40,000 grant from Haystack and the MacArthur Foundation to take your concept and turn it into an entire level pack. So we freaked out. We're like, oh my God, we're going to actually be doing this. And so we ended up, first of all, it was a year long contract. We delivered it in six months. It was a blast where Trevor and I really hunkered down and did that. 
But as we started engaging with these people about it, they took us out to uh, Games for Change in New York. And we saw that there was this kind of hunger for education stuff out there. And at first we were very like hesitant about that because we're like, well, we're a normal game studio. We want to develop Shattered Soul. We don't want to do stuff for classrooms necessarily. But then as we started going more into that world, we were like, well, that's kind of a false dichotomy because you know, everyone has this belief that you're either normal game studio or education game studio, but there's no actual law saying that you have to be one or the other. It's, you know, it seemed like it was just a false thing that people made up. So we're like, well, we start telling people we're a teaching studio that, you know, we sometimes like to make normal games that aren't educational. We sometimes like to make educational stuff. And either way, we like to teach people about what we're learning in the process. And it eventually got so much attention to the point where we started getting asked to do uh, game design camps at museums, colleges, and schools. We started getting more education opportunities. We nearly won a $10 million grant where we almost opened up a high school that was designed to feel like a game studio. We came in the semifinals in a competition where we almost got that. And it just got to the point where it became obvious that we needed to more formalize our education stuff. And that's where Ingenium came in. So that's why we have two different sides now. And it's led to the point where we're doing education stuff all over. We do virtual reality demos all over. Like for instance, we'll go to a school in the morning. We'll do uh, like what we call a planet point, which is like a PowerPoint presentation we built inside of Little Big Planet that covers all the different jobs in the industry. And then for the rest of the day, we'll go set up in the school's library with PlayStation VR headsets. And people will come in and we'll show them how tech works and how this translates to jobs. And especially for uh, PlayStation VR worlds where they have that shark dive, we have a PVC shark cage that we built. So people have to climb in the shark cage, shut the door, put the headset on. And like it got to the point where, for instance, uh, Spokane's Children's Hospital just asked us to come out and do the demo for them for their birthday bash. So we were teaching kids there as part of their thing. And um, as far as, you know, actual projects go going right now, we're working on Shared Soul. We're also working on a rhythm game called Burst, which we're pitching around to publishers right now that is a game where you blow up fireworks to the beat of music. And as you're blowing up the fireworks, you pull the triggers on the controller to swap out elements from the periodic table to change the colors of the explosions. And those are the actual elements that give colors to fireworks in real life. And our, our whole point with Burst is trying to make that point that we learned ourselves, which is that you can have educational content in games that aren't necessarily directly aimed at classroom use only, that you can do stuff where the STEM and STEAM content is integrated in a game in the way that the player actually cares about it. And I, we're not even the first to say it, but we're just trying to add to that conversation. I agree. I've, I've been playing Graveyard Keeper this morning and I have learned several things that we can turn dead human bodies into. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh... <laughs> but I mean, that is, I mean, that is fantastic. I was at uh, a conference years ago where, and I can't remember the guy's name. It's the guy from, I call him the guy from Wings, but he's also the um, the, the father on Madam Secretary. Anyway, he was there giving a talk and, and the, the Sandbox uh, Summit is all about bringing, you know, game companies and television companies and educators and, you know, everybody together to you know do exactly this sort of stuff and that's the first time i heard you know the phrase you know steam versus stem and he yeah. had a good point he, he said you know you can have your your science your technology your engineering your math but if you don't have the arts you have no way of conveying that love that education and so oh, absolutely it, you know and i i wholeheartedly agree and you know like um Div says, you know, we're seeing more of that with like things like Kerbal Space Program. Um, you know, there is, we're finally losing that stigma to an extent anyway. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if someone called me and they said, yeah, we're going to do an edutainment title, I would just, my eyes would roll back in my head and go, no, you know, it's not going to work. You know, you've got to first and foremost have something that is entertaining because if it's not entertaining, yes. you know, the kids aren't going to play it or, or the grownups aren't going to play it or, or you know whoever it's going to be i have a, a seven-year-old he plays Fortnite with me so you know put him down on you know some simplistic you know 2d what we usually you know the run-of-the-mill educational title which aren't well developed and you know he, he's not going to be nearly as engaged and i'm not saying 
every educational title needs to look like Fortnite, but you know, there is a level of design intelligence and you know, yes. UI intelligence and graphics that has to go into all this, or, you know, it, it's simply not going to work. So, it, like it has to respect the art form just as much as it respects the steam content. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like he was in a uh, Kerbal space program. That's a good example. I mean, even Minecraft really is an example how you combine things oh, yeah. and you make things. It's just not so like in depth, but which by the way, too, which, by the way uh, mom did bring me a quick note. I forgot to mention this part in my whole opening spiel, but <laughs> as part of uh, education stuff in Little Big Planet, it's one thing that we just announced this like two weeks ago. It's been in the works for about three months, but we're uh, content advisors and content creators on a team of people based out of Montana State University, which is in Bozeman, a couple hours away from here. And those, the professors we were working with went after a National Science Foundation grant, and we just got awarded a three-year National Science Foundation grant to find out if games like Little Big Planet and Dreams can uh, encourage kids to develop what they call engineer identities, where they view themselves as engineers and work to pursue harder careers and harder classes because yes. of it. Yeah. Yes. I, we were having a conversation on the way home last night, and I cannot remember what the conversation was, but my son said, what's an engineer? And I said, you know, there are people that, that build things and there's a lot of different kinds of things. And you know, it's, it's, you know, he's seven. So his, his version of build things is pretty dynamic. But the way that I brought yeah. it back to him was Tony Stark is an engineer. Like, Oh, okay. That's what, you know, that's what it does. And so that's, yeah. Dude, that's congratulations. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I mean, it's totally in our wheelhouse because, like I said, you know, with the rides and roller coasters thing, I didn't realize we were stepping into that role when I first did it, but it was one of those things that, okay, if I want rides and roller coasters in Little Big Planet, I'm going to probably have to make them myself, which means I'm going to have to teach myself something to, in order to build them. So it got to the point where we give talks to kids about this now, but I would go to the fair and walk around the swinging boat ride and take pictures of it and all the different hinge points and all that. And it got to the point where um i can try to see if i can share it to the chat but i ended up building one that i got a lot of acclaim for that you actually could step on a button and it takes itself apart folds down on a trailer and then you can drive it off and then set it up again somewhere else that's awesome and yeah and i tell kids that you know i'm not i don't consider myself you know a uh, genius or anything it's just one of those things <laughs> that i was given the opportunity to engage with the content in a way that i could work with it and so you know it's more it's less about being born right or born smart more about willingness to engage with problem solving and understanding you won't get it right the first time but if you keep at it you'll learn enough where you'll eventually get it yep that's exactly it, it, it it's what's that it, what's that one game besieged where you build these giant Destro destroying robots and some of them roll, some of them walk, and you have to put all the joints together. And is that what it is? Besides, I don't know. I haven't seen that. Look, let me look. No, but I mean, we've got up. these. Well, they did the the bridge constructor, you know, game yeah. that was really big on mobile, and now they've got a version of it that they've licensed with Valve, and so it's Portal, which I just adore. I play that game all the time, just simply to hear Glados because I've loved Glados. But yeah, you know, there's so many of these games now. You know, we have um, the incredible what, what is it, the machine game for VR, where you know you have to build little cars and things like that to accomplish a task. You know, my son loves it, and, and so you know that's the thing. It's like you can you can teach these theories, you know, without having to like hammer it into them with some kind of you know engineering background and i remember what led to the engineer we were talking about gears because he was asking about the gear shift and i was like you know mechanical things that move have gears and he goes my scooter doesn't have gears and i went okay yes you're right you know but that that listen you're working on dad's level of engineering here so go with me on this but yeah. you know you're able to see all that stuff in everything down to you know legos today and so um it's awesome that you know we i'm thrilled to be raising a kid in the industry that we're in in the environment that we're in where you know i can simply say 
let me see, do you know how big Jupiter is? And he's like, yeah, it's really big. And I'm like, no, here, put on this VR headset and hold up Earth and hold up Jupiter. And that's how, you know, big it is. So, um, yeah, it's, we live in a wonderful time. Oh, absolutely. And, um, like, with that kind of stuff, with the creative stuff, I got to say, too, that, you know, we've made friends with people at Media Molecule and stuff. And at E3, we got an hour-long hands-on with Dreams. And holy crap like you know if you think what you can do in like little big planets expansive like the way we've been saying it is we kind of borrowed this description from insomniac with the description i they the way they described the original little big planet back in the day but it's like you know you get so used to carving wheels out of stone and then all of a sudden a freaking harrier lands next to you <laughs> you know like we like we were just sitting there and the guy sat us down he's like okay cool we're gonna build an entire game in less than an hour we're like really and so we did you know a little bit of animation we and they saved us some time because if you want to fully animate a character in dreams you can but that's going to be way more than an hour but we built an entire level and then they handed the controller to our la coordinator colin hit a button they turned into musical instruments and they jammed together and created the backtrack and the background music of the entire level and all the stuff that they were doing is stuff that we're used to seeing in like different uh, games, but we're like looking at it going, Oh my God, this is, we can show this directly to kids. And, you know, they reiterated what they've told people a lot of times like, Oh, by the way, if you build a character or a car or whatever that you really like, you just hit this button over here and it sends you an OBJ file to your computer that you can 3d print. Yes. And have it, oh and you, God. Yes. And That's... you can have it in real life. Yeah. You but, go ahead. Oh, and, and thank you for the hundred biddies. Woo! We got hundred biddies. That was a milestone, Andy. I think that's the first first biddies. First biddies, aside from like maybe something me, you, you and I threw out that you know we have, we've had on the show. So thank you, Ego Ant. Oh, and I got I completely lost my train of thought there. What were we on, Josh? Oh, about like dreams and stuff, which I have to say too, like I was really pumped that, you know, we just became Twitch partners the other day We because Twitch found out about our outreach, told us do two test months to prove that you can bring your education stuff to our platform. We did that. And so they flipped the switch and made us partners. And so we just had a guy give us our first bit the other day. So it's like, we just made our first eight cents on Twitch and we were so <laughs> ridiculously pumped about it. And we're like, dude, thank you so much. Hey, look, when, maybe when you get to the level of success that we're at, you'll be making <laughs> our kind of money, which is, I think, like $9 a month. You know, it's um, absolutely yeah. staggering yeah. how we have to budget all of this stuff now. Um, it's So tell us a little about, you know, the, the channel, basically, you know, because obviously, yeah. you know, I knew you guys, you know, we've been talking, you know, on the other business end of the thing for a couple of months now, but you know, you're doing something with the show that we're doing as well from a whole different angle. So, you know, it's, it has been my mentality that there aren't enough shows like this on Twitch. We have this wonderful medium and so many playing Fortnite, but you know, we need to do some education, you know, for the industry and for others as well along the way. So, Tell us a little bit about the channel and, you know, what you do, I mean, what's on there and the kind of stuff you cover and all that, all that nice things. Yeah. Well, and, um, yeah, so, like, and, uh, you know, I kind of, I'm kind of glad you brought up the Fortnite thing, too, because, you know, there's no hatred or anger towards Fortnite or anything, but it's one of those things that, you know, when we first started our channel, we were like, well, should we do the popular thing and at least have one day where we try Fortnite? And we just realized it wasn't our forte, and it's great that other people have that handled, but why try to step into the overcrowded part of Twitch, you know, when there's yeah. other people already dominating that. But, um, yeah, so Twitch saw that we were doing, like, game design camps for kids and doing talks, and, and some of our game design camps are becoming more remote because uh, here in Montana, obviously, we have, you know, schools that are rural, whether they're, like, farm areas or uh, tribal reservation. And, you know, for the record, you know, a lot of people think that that's all Montana is. We do have some cities, but there's also like a lot more people out in those more remote areas. So we've been trying to figure out how to bring them content and game development knowledge to drive home that you can learn from where you're at. You know, you don't have to be born in the right place, you know? So uh, Twitch was excited about that. And so we started working with them. And what we wanted to do with the channel is kind of a mix of everything. And so we do game design 101 on Mondays, like for instance, yesterday, or no, two days ago now, 
uh, we ran uh, like our 3D artist, Philip, found some old videos of him doing 3D art and texturing. So we're calling him Philip's Lost Episodes and we're running that right now. But we also do like game design talks on Monday. We also do programming demonstrations. We also do videos where we go and show what it's like to pitch a game and, or like different technology in the industry. We did one, one episode where we compared how camera technology has evolved in gaming from you know, like the Game Boy camera to connect, you know, <laughs> just for fun, you know, just random stuff. Just to I show forgot people. the Game Boy had a camera back in the day. <laughs> yeah, well, and we actually too. didn't even have the printer. So we were printing yes. stuff off on the street, which was great. So, but um, like show people how you can learn from the past and build off of it. And then like Tuesdays and Fridays and sometimes Saturdays, we do the fun hangout streams where Sometimes it's educational, sometimes it's not. Currently, our obsession on those days has been that we're playing through uh, Shenmue 1 and 2 and talking about how all the games that came out after Shenmue that are open world built off of at least some parts of it and even got to the point where yesterday uh, the team that, I mean, it's not the entire team, but it's like basically the remnants of the team that made Shenmue that eventually became the Yakuza team uh, announced at Sony's Tokyo Game Show press conference that they're working on a new game called Project Judge. And there was a Japanese only demo on the PSN. And I happened to have a sub account that's Japanese for that very reason. So I hopped on the <laughs> Japanese account and downloaded the demo and played it for the Twitch fans and was showing, okay, here's what you're seeing in Shenmue. Here's how it evolved, you know, 16 years later to be, you know, Project Judge. And here's what they carried over. Here's what they realized needed changing. And that's how you iterate and that's how you build off of stuff. And it became a really fun educational thing where we, and for the record, the demo was amazing. So I cannot wait for that to hit here. But um, then like Wednesdays, we do Planet Coaster because it just kind of evolved into things since I'm obsessed with rides that uh, people were filling my chat going, well, we need to do more Planet Coaster stuff. Let's go have fun there. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's apparently our Fortnite. So we build rides and theme them and people will put up in chat what they want to see, like whether they want to see like a zero G roll on the ride or if they want to see like a desert theme and then we'll, work it around what they want. Uh, Thursdays, my mom, who's one of our co-founders, uh, wrote a young adult adventure novel, kind of in the vein of like Harry Potter or Hunger Games, called The Messenger of Eshra. So she's reading a few chapters every week, and we're trying out that kind of book club thing on Thursdays. And Saturday, like I said, Fridays and Saturdays are kind of fun hangout days. And then Sunday, we actually have a show called Gamer Momology, where mom talks about her experiences in the game industry and learning to network it uh, as Trevor and I play a game of our choice. Like right now, the big thing for that is that we're playing through Final Fantasy VII from beginning to end. So we're trying to show that people that there's education in the industry, there's room for family environment, there's room for dignity and respect and showing people how one of the reasons we've been able to make it as a small studio in Montana is because whenever we go to industry events, we push the dignity and respect thing. And mom tells everyone the story that the first time she ever went to E3, she had several people from PlayStation pull her aside and say, I want to tell you about your kids. And, There's mom. Yeah, mom's <laughs> like running in really quick. She's gonna sing for us. Yeah, <laughs> at some point it'll, it'll take a lot of pushing, but <laughs> like, uh, and so she she always tells people that you know the first C three she went to she had several people from Sony pull her aside and say I want to tell you about your boys, and that it's so rare to see dignity and respect and that made them stand out and so that's the story she tells everyone now because. It seriously does. In our world, it makes you stand out if you walk with dignity and respect. And she also struck me another note, but to mention, too, that on a show that we do kind of infrequently because it's whenever Trevor can film an episode because, like, for instance, Trevor's in dialysis right now. We're going to go pick him up in about an hour and a half. But he does dialysis three times a week and physical therapy one of those other days. So he's tired and down a lot of the time. But uh, he does a show when we can do it where we film it called 8-Bit Bites that he does a cooking show that's gamer centric. And most of the time it's based around the idea of teaching gamers how to make meals and snacks that are controller, keyboard and mouse friendly. Although some of our episodes don't really fit that mold. And we just, we have one coming up this Saturday too. Keyboard friendly food. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm sitting here remembering all these questions that are popping into my head because yeah. they're going very quickly. Montana. Now you're the first PlayStation studio in montana how many other studios are in montana uh to my knowledge uh one other one there's a group called wolf mobile out of helena our state capital and we're really good friends with them they're awesome guys uh there is another studio here that does more uh like pen and paper rpgs and they do some work in rpg maker 
Yeah. And then there used to be one that was working on a first person shooter, although from my understanding that fell through. So, I mean, the ability to have traditional in-person meetups, and we see these a lot in the bigger cities with, um, you know, like with the IGDA mixers or, you know, local groups. I know Seattle has the uh, Seattle Online Broadcaster Association and they get together and do all this stuff. That simply isn't going to happen, you know, where yep. you all are. So to overcome that, you know, you've not only got the channel, but, you know, how how else do you, you know, get in, you know, catch up with everybody, you know, network, all of that stuff. How have you had to approach that side of the industry being as remote as you are? Uh, one, we try to hit at least two conferences a year. Right now it's E3 and PlayStation Experience. Two, we, like I said, push dignity and respect because it is absolutely important. So for instance, one thing we teach kids is that with, you know, business cards, if someone hands you a business card, take the time to actually look at it, follow the Japanese rules, you know, treat it like a present, you know, show that you're not just, you know, casually or whatever and putting it in your pocket. Uh, we do a lot of work to make sure that we're constantly in people's faces online. And I don't mean that in like a mean way, but I mean that <laughs> in a, like in a way of, we constantly have people seeing what we're doing online. So for instance, when we uh, do education game design camps, since we're teaching kids with Little Big Planet, we will tag Little Big Planet and PlayStation, who will generally in turn retweet it and say, oh my God, this is so cool that you guys are still doing this. It's so cool how many lives are impacted and then other people see it. And then one of the big things too is just build relationships with people because uh, like for instance, you know, you know uh, I'm kind of, I'm Facebook friends with him. I don't really talk with him that much, but Shahid Ahmad, who used to be one of the big indie evangelists at PlayStation, calls pitching uh, in the game industry a sense of courtship. And it's all about that relationship. And it's all about meeting people, like connecting with them on like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and showing that you're interested in being like connected to them for more than just what you can get out of it. So for instance, like saying happy birthday to them or commenting if they have a major life event, like if they're sad that, you know, something bad happened in their life saying, oh my God, I'm so sorry. If you need someone to vent, I'm here. Showing that you're an actual human being, not just someone looking for something from them. And that will generally build connections that can withstand the fact that, you know, you're not always on the in the same neck of the woods as them. Because I mean, we have business contacts that we talk to fairly regularly that are sometimes on the other side of the planet because you know for instance talking with sony europe and uh the little big planet team or media molecule team you know in order to build that relationship that we had to overcome that distance barrier anyways and i mean it, it, there is some positive and negative to it because you know in one sense like you said we can't go to regular dev meetups but on the other hand we do get that novelty of being the montana guys so people remember us a lot faster and what we tell people is that when you get that kind of novelty you need to be aware that that's going to either be really good or really bad because depending on how you behave they will remember it they'll either remember you as really good or they will remember you as a complete asshole and you will never get that chance to fix it exactly that's why we always tell people you know you you can't burn bridges in this industry yes it's a big industry and it's a, it's a very profitable industry and it's global but at the end of the day you know it, everybody knows everybody in an ex to an extent you know yeah. and, and so it doesn't take long for you know if, if we've got a new developer or something coming in for us to make a phone call or two or or an email or two and we can find out what we need to know about that studio and you know when you're at these conferences i love the idea of like treating every business card as the japanese dude because one mm -hmm. it's respectful and two, it keeps you from fucking up when somebody from Japan gives you one. You know, yep. for those of you who don't know, when you have a, I'm trying to find a business card, um, I will use a uh, Pokemon card instead. So when you have a nerd, you know, in Japan, <laughs> they will actually present their card to you. I can't even see if I'm actually on camera doing this, um, but they will present their card to you, you know, face up so you can see it. And so then you accept the card with two hands and you look at it for a minute, you know, read it or at least act like you read it, but, you know, and you acknowledge it that, you know, this is a matter of respect, you know, back yes. and forth. And then you don't take it and shove it in your back pocket or, you know, whatever you, you treat that card as if it was an extension of that person, like someone said earlier. So, you know, it is 
absolutely a wonderful idea to do that. But, you know, when you're at these shows, if you're meeting with a, a producer or a QA lead or something, you know, along those lines, people move up in this industry pretty fast. Oh, so, yeah. You know, you can totally diss on this person. And then three years later, you're turning around trying to pitch a game or trying to, you know, work with somebody. And that QA lead is now an executive producer. You, you're you screwed up and there's nothing you can do to get it back. So, you know, it's, um, it's, it is very important. I love the, the respect idea and, and the mentality around that. Oh yeah. Well, I, and like one way I've heard it put is like back when I worked retail is on average, uh, it takes 12 positive interactions to fix one negative one and good luck getting the 12. It That's seems important. like it's more than that though. I've never heard that thing about business cards, but I have like handed someone a business card and they just go, Oh, thanks. And then stick it in their pocket. And you're like, well, at least look at it, dude. Isn't you know it? what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and nowadays, like so many people, cause I, I read a lot of Twitch stuff on social media and they're like, Oh, business cards are da 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 da. Don't use business card. Definitely have a freaking business card, yes. especially if you're on Twitch, have like your yeah. Twitch one, which I, well, here's my Twitch one right here. And it doesn't have yep. like personal information. Bam. Well, you probably can't because it's a green screen. And then I have it's my face color. on it because. That is, that um, is currently. Oh my God, that is cool. I mean, and my my mom was a delegate at the uh, Demo one of the Democratic conventions. And her thing was put your face on your stuff because you're going to get a business card. It's going to be white, have all this information on it. You're going to look at it and go, who is this person? But with my card, you'll go. Oh, it was this dude right here. I remember that oh, dude. Oh, it was that dude. It was this dude. So out of 100 business cards, people are going to go, oh, I remember this dude. And bam, they'll know. And then also have like your personal one that you hand out for business. I like it. this one shouldn't be handed out for business. This one should just be handed out for whatever. But I yeah, I like that whole Wait, thing. Um, even if you have a face that looks like Indies. Yes. I mean, because at least it's memorable. <laughs> Which I do right? want to cover what, what Gamer Husband with Kids said too. Yes. Also, with the J Japanese respect thing, man, don't tip in Japan because it like comes off as like, oh, you need this more than I do, and it comes off as rude and degrading. Give people gifts that uh, have, like, for instance, the key we mailed Jay some keychains. Like Trevor got a Make a Wish for his kidneys, and we went to Japan and we made a bunch of kid uh, keychains to give out as gifts instead of tips, and that just kind of became a thing. And now we give keychains all over the place. They're awesome. Uh, yeah. That's another thing too. And like I said, the reason we're bringing Japan up so much is they're kind of the strictest when it comes to politeness and respect. Look at what your industry's into, take the strictest set of rules, follow those rules. And that way you're sure you're not going to mistreat someone or make them feel like dirt. You're dead on. What is it? Every, every person tips 120%? No, no, no. Uh, people get like 120% the wage we think they get in Japan. Like everyone in Japan gets a pretty good wage. Like there's no one that really makes a crap wage at a restaurant. So if you tip, it comes off as saying, Oh, you need this more than I do. Like it comes off as like uh, you're looking your nose down at them. Ah, uh, interesting. So, all right. Um, well, there were several questions that I saw. Ego Ant wanted to know if your mom is on Wattpad or Fic Fun or anything like that with her books. Uh, she is on Amazon self-published. Let me go ahead and grab the, I can get you guys the link here and put it in the chat. Thank and you for asking that because I totally missed that question. Since our little bot kicked up that thing about submitting the games, I will take a second and say next week, we're going to have Martin Spans, a friend of mine from over on the other side of the pond, over in the Netherlands. She, uh, is a judge on indie game competitions. So if you want her to look at your game live, it's not a competition. It's just, you know, feedback from someone who does these types of comp who does judge these types of competitions. Um, submit it to uh, us via that link that it just had or ping indie or I over on uh, Discord on our Discord channel. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, small aside there. Um, and then there was something else in Twitch that I saw. Oh, taller than you. You don't. So going back to the, to the business cards, the business cards are given at the beginning of a conversation. So you don't necessarily have to stop your conversation. You know, it's a, you know, excuse me. 
you meet at a conference or you meet, you know, bar, wherever, and you introduce yourself, you do the card, that everybody takes a second to look at the card, and then, you know, you go forward from the conversation at that point. You don't have to, it's not something you have to completely, um, you know, stop what you're doing because you're usually going at the very beginning of the introduction, at the um, interaction anyway. Um, that, that's actually interesting because in uh, like our culture, you talk to the person first and then decide if you want to give them your business card. Then you give them your business card at, you know, if it's like whatever, then you give them your card after the conversation. See, I always give it at the beginning because in my mind, there's really no such thing as a bad contact because uh -huh. again, you don't know where that person's going to be in 10 years. Yep. And it is all about, you know, relationships. And, and, you know, there are times that even I get behind on it and it's what I preach and it's what I do every day. You yeah. know, it's, you know, I've got 2,500 some connections on LinkedIn and, you know, I sat down in January and I'm like, I got to figure out who half these people are because, you know, I don't, I'll get them coming in and I accept it and I've gotten much stricter about that now. But, you know, I started trying to send everyone at least a, Hey, this is what I'm doing these days message on LinkedIn. And I don't think I was able to get through the seas before, you know, wife caught up with me. Um, but it's, you know, it is one of those things where when you're doing the biz dev side of the world, you know, it's about relationships. It's not necessarily about, you know, just because you have someone's email address, you know, that's not very valuable. It's, you know, having the relationship. So when you email them, they go, Oh yeah, exactly. You know, we can go from there. So yeah. They actually want to talk to you. Yeah, bingo. Would you take Andy's face at the beginning, Jay? Lily, no <laughs> such thing as a bad yes. contact. Well, you don't know Lily well enough yet. <laughs> womp, womp, see, womp. We know you, you, you know, you're in here, so you must be, you know, bright and, and wanting to learn. And so, yeah, you're, you're good to go. Oh, and Davies Oatmeal, it, you know, we're looking at anything. I mean, the only, the only, you know, criteria I would say is you need to have at least a vertical slice, you know, so it, there's enough that it can be judged basically. And I, you know, I've done judging for indie prize and competitions as well. And yeah, there are some things that get submitted and you plan for five minutes and you're like, this isn't going to cut it. Um, but, you know, we're trying to, uh, we want to give mock feedback basically, but it's not, mock feedback it is real feedback but in the same sense that a good pr firm will throw your game out to you know reviewers to do a mock review which is where they review it just like they would for their website or their publication but then they don't publish it they send it to you and say this is what we would say if it was submitted right now it's that kind of thing you know this is a a mock review at a competition level so that's you know it, it doesn't matter you know there's no you know, stipulation on, is it a game jam game? Is it not, you know, that sort of stuff. So it, it, it is what it is. Excellent. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up on chat, which I suck at catching up on chat. All right, so Josh. Yeah. You've got the, the channel where you're doing the education stuff, which is fantastic. Now, and I might've missed this when you were talking earlier, are you, are your, um, like children's education, your, your early programming, is that on Twitch? Is that on YouTube? I mean, are you archiving that or is it just something that y'all do, you know, in person when you go to the schools? Uh, we're starting to archive it more like or the way our Twitch is set up. We basically save everything. So if you guys click on our videos and collections, we have different breakdown collections like game design 101, 8 bit bites, mom's reading of her book and Shenmue playthroughs, all of it. And we're trying to do more online so that way we can you know, not only give people on Twitch general access, but also give another resource to the schools we work with that are remote. So for instance, on you know YouTube, I did five videos that I'll probably remake on Twitch of quick game design basics and little big planet so that you, know, you can go from not knowing how to do anything to doing the basics, like creating a basic battle arena, creating a basic platforming level, creating a basic enemy. And, you know, we always try to attach to, okay, this is what the game is telling you it's called. Here's how it translates to a real life job. So uh, we're, like I said, we're archiving everything. So feel free to peruse all our videos. We usually have, 
we try to have reruns running so that way when people come to our page they see something but under the col uh, collections and videos there's just tons of stuff there already and we're constantly adding more to it that's awesome so so here's one of my wish lists for you guys and, and when you were talking about Shinmu and how it was one of the world it was one of the first you know truly open world games because i remember when that game came out it's like yeah. what do you mean you could just like go into a bar and play you know pool for an hour it's like that's not is that a quest no that's just something you can do yeah and i've seen a few of these done but i would love to see you know somebody take it seriously and you know deconstruct modern games you know it, it's like you just said you know you've got you know something like zelda brings this part of level design in and this part of open world in and literally like backtrack a game to some of the first instances of that you know happening you know i think that type of stuff is fantastic not only is it just entertaining as hell because you 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 learn about things that you might not have known about but you know indie games catch crap i'm trying not to curse as much but it's not going to really work indie games catch a bunch of shit because they're out of the blue and it's not you know call of duty and it's not blah 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 well um call of duty and these big triple a games are ev evolutions of things that we see in indie development or in mod development everybody was talking yes. yesterday about the new call of duty has a you know battle royale mode and how it's fantastic well do you honestly think it would have had a battle royale mode if PUBG and Fortnite hadn't done what they did in 2017? Yeah, no, they wouldn't. And so, you know, it's it's that sort of stuff that, you know, and, and it's not it's not like Fortnite. You, you could take it a step further back than that. You know, Fortnite and PUBG came from um, what was the one the H1Z1. You know, which came from a, you know, there was a Minecraft mod and there was all of these, you know, different things that go backwards that, you know, people don't necessarily always know. Um, and I remember my favorite, you know, well, I've got two, but my very favorite one was, you know, when I was growing up and I was in high school and college, we played Warlords like constantly. And it was this old strategy game from SSG. And it was, you know, at the time when I, and when I first came into the industry, it was my holy grail. I mean, it was absolutely the series that I loved the most. And I, you know, sat down with a guy who I can, you know, I consider my friend now, even though we were competitors back in the day, his name's Ed Deal. And he, you know, he is one of the most, um, if not the most successful agents in the world. And that's what I did for the first, you know, eight years of my career. But we were at a uh, like a game connection. Might have been one of the very first game connection events over in France. And Ed sits down and he's pitching me this game, and he said, "We took, you know, this Warlords franchise that you may or may not be familiar with, and and mirrored it with Bejeweled." And like I, the blood went out of my face. I was just like, "No, you didn't. You did not absolutely destroy this franchise." Well that game that he would pitch to me became known as puzzle quest which you know is we all have that spawned countless like versions on mobile you know yeah <laughs> but you know it's one of those examples where you know we had a studio with enough forethought and they didn't have a publisher on it obviously or ed wouldn't have been going around pitching this thing you know they had enough forethought to say we can't just keep doing a strategy game over and over and over and over you know we got to do something different and so let's take something that's completely out of right field and bring in a casual, you know, match three game and turn it into a new RPG. And it, it's one of the... And that, that spawned such, a bunch of other games yes, just like it. I mean, of, thousands oh, upon yeah. thousands yeah. upon thousands of them. Oh, yeah. And, um, like, for instance, in our stream, so, for instance, like I mentioned, we did that camera uh, stream where we covered camera tech evolving. That same time we did that episode which is archived is was half hardware and the hardware side was the cameras the other side was software where we covered how different game design aspects evolved and in that case we were using different kinds of platforming games and we compared uh super mario brothers 3 to crash bandicoot to little big planet and 
showed how the same ideas were present, just remixed. So we're, that, that was that thing where we were breaking down and taking different aspects. And then a week ago, if I remember correctly, and again, this one's archived too, we did a stream called the 90s 3D fighting games that inspired Shattered Soul. And we have a PS2 hooked up to our cap card. So we went through and played 12 different 90s 3D fighting games and said, okay, here's how this game played. Here's how it inspired us. Here's the element that we took. And then at the end, we played uh, the current build of Shattered Soul's uh, prototype pitch and said, here's where you can see all these different elements that were like, not fully working yet because we're still polishing that pitch demo. But you could see where we took ideas from these different games and brought them together to make our own unique expression. And that's how you can do it too for your stuff. See, and, and that is that is fantastic because I do think we all get in, no matter what we're doing, you know, we all get into tunnel vision every now and then. And you know, this is how you know we have to do multiplayer or single player or cameras or design or narrative or however it is, you know because this is how it's done. And it takes indie games coming in and saying, hey, you don't have to do that. Here, here's something completely you know, different. Here's a whole new way you can do it. And you know, I was talking with you know, Yulia last night, who's gonna be on the show, is she on this Friday? This Friday or next Friday? I think she's this Friday. Um, you know, with Tiny Build and, and my wife, bless her, uh, over the last 15 years has seen, you know, me through all these different you know careers and and not careers all the same pretty much career but you know as we've evolved as a company and and the industry has evolved and she's a casual gamer she's not like a deep deep gamer but i was like we were talking about graveyard keeper and i was like yeah so remember all those tycoon games we used to play back in the day i said now there's one where you manage manage a graveyard and you know you can decide whether or not you want to poison the townspeople and you know reject you know recycle their parts into something else and she's just like really? <laughs> yeah, somebody has to do it. And and that's what, you know, we see with this stuff, you know, and it's, um, it, we're fortunate to have a platform and, and an ecosystem in the, in the industry, you know, where we can release ideas, you know, like on itch.io or, or, you know, game jams. And, you know, that was, that's a fantastic thing to have. And so it really, it always gets under my skin when I see people you know, trashing indie games. It's like, you know, that's, you, you can't do that, you know, because those are the games that's going to make, you know, if you only want to play AAA games, that's fine. But those ideas have to come from somewhere. So, yep. Oh, um, so, all right. You've got, let's, let's jump a little bit back into the management side of the world and the tools that you all use. You're managing 35 people. And, you know, like you said, they're not all working at a single time it's not like you have a full-blown studio where everybody is sitting in a in a big office together uh, but like ego ant said earlier you know the fact that you're in montana and you are isolated you know geographically basically is is a lot like where they are in alberta and it's like that all over the world it's you know games aren't solely developed in san francisco seattle new york and vancouver i mean they're yeah everywhere and so how do you manage, you, you mentioned that you use, you know, Trello and email, of course, but, you know, how do you do task management? How do you organize the company? Do you have, you know, producers or senior producers or lead tech leads? Walk us through how it's, you know, organized and then how you actually keep everybody going in, in roughly the same direction. Yeah. So mom, Trevor, and I are basically the co-founders. Uh, I'm basically like lead game designer, writer, business plan guy, uh, social media guy right now. I mean, we have two people that also help out on social media, but I kind of spearhead it right now. And Trevor helps with concepts. Mom helps with HR and books. From there, uh, we have like a lead uh, art director who kind of oversees everything and Let's us know, you know, helps me explain to the team, okay, we need this in this poly count and that kind of stuff. Cause he's, he actually uh, can teach, he actually used to teach college for 3D art. He's now a stay at home dad. But uh, then from there, we have uh, 3D artists and programmers. Like we have a lead programmer named Emily that is really awesome. That basically, I, we talk with the lead saying, okay, this is what we want done. And this is the arbitrary deadline we're going by because you know, we'll, we'll pick a day 
two to three months out and saying, okay, how many features can we get done by that day? And we'll work towards that. So for instance, right now, our big thing is um, we just got invited that there's a fighting game tournament here in Montana called the Fall Brawl that happens at the end of October. And they've asked us to come out because they love the idea that there's a fighting game being made in Montana. So they wanted us to come demo it. Like, okay, how many features can we get in polished into our pitch demo by then? So our other programmer, Gerardo, is working on that right now and trying to get as much done as he can. And then Emily's working away on Burst. And with, you know, in the case of Burst, we're just going around pitching it while we're constantly adding features to it. And the thing is, we're you know, it's not just that we're a studio. We're also all really good friends with each other. So we're always in contact on Facebook and Twitter and all that. And so we're just always talking to each other. And we're always like, okay, it just comes up, you know, we'll be talking about like what we do and do not like about Final Fantasy 15. And I'll be like, oh, uh, by the way, how's this section of the game doing? Okay, that's doing good. Okay, cool. Do you think we could have it done by this time? Sure, let's move on that. So we've developed a really good rhythm for working on it. And it's been good in a lot of ways although you know we're definitely ready to hit that mile mark where we can get a publishing deal somewhere and hopefully get the kind of funding that we can you know have more of our staffers not worry about needing a day job and just have this be their day job because we're pretty good at getting stuff done around all of our commitments but it'd be really awesome if we could all dedicate a guaranteed 40 hours a week to it you know for only 40 hours a week right how, how yeah, does that but, work I was trying to avoid making a pro crunch comment, but yeah. Well, I mean, <coughs> crunch, crunch in the negative <laughs> sense is never a good thing. But you know, as long as you can manage that work life balance, it is. I have weeks where I work less than forty. I have weeks that I work more than forty, and it's simply because I love what I do, and so yeah. it's you know there is a aspect of you know keeping people's nose to the ground but there's also that aspect of if you push them too far and you know they're not enjoying what they do anymore it's over you know they're yeah. going to leave or, or their quality is going to fall off dramatically you know it, it's a very tight you know tight rope to walk yeah they're human beings not cattle kind of thing exactly despite the, the way that they get treated a lot so yeah and that's one of the things that, you know, we strive to be different on that, which, I mean, you know, we're a small studio right now, so it doesn't necessarily make a lot of ripples, but we do pride ourselves on the fact that, you know, we push dignity and respect first and that, you know, since we're unfunded right now, we go from grant to grant and all that kind of stuff. We do what we can to make sure it's worth our staffers while. So, for instance, if they're applying for a job at a different studio, we make sure to write them a letter of recommendation. We try to get them hookups for different paid gigs. Like when I find out that someone's looking for an artist online, I'll send my team a private message on the Discord saying, hey, I found out a guy's looking for this for a paid gig. Are any of you free? Do any of you want it? If so, I'll make the intro. So that's one of those things that we, you know, we, and we get them passes to E3 and goody hookups whenever we can. So it's one of those things that if you're going to start an indie studio, that's got to be, it's back to that dignity and respect thing. You know, treat them as a human being that deserves dignity and respect and treat people how you want to be treated. Sounds like we're going to come work for you. Yeah. <laughs> So they don't have hurricanes in Montana either. Um, no. they, <laughs> they don't have hurricanes no. in Oregon. Yeah, but y'all have earthquakes and volcanoes. We, we don't have earthquakes. We had well, there's been one earthquake where I lived my whole entire life. We did have oh, Mount St. Helens, but that was like, you know, and there was ash for a couple weeks, but <laughs> So like the earthquake are you talking about? Are you talking about the one that was cuz you know normally we if you talk to geologists, they'll tell you that Montana is a seismically active state, although there's only ever been one earth, real earthquake here in my life, and I'm pretty sure we're talking about the same one that was like last year, right? Oh, I have no idea about earthquakes in Montana. Oh, like, because you're in I Oregon, was talking, right? I was talking about Oregon. Yeah, the one in Montana that we had last year was felt in like, as far away as Oregon and Spokane and oh. Washington. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it was funny because, like, I mean, not funny, but it was terrifying, but it was uh, de dead center in this town called Lincoln, Montana, which is a town that it has really great beef jerky and is desperate to be known for anything but the fact that they were the home of the Unabomber. And hey, look, everybody's got to have their hook. You know? Yeah. It's... 
But so it turned out to be centered in Lincoln. And we have a friend on Facebook that lived there who was in the process of rebuilding her house and only had three of the four walls up when the earth, when a, it was like a 6.0 or a 7.0 hit. Jeez. So the Facebook updates were very interesting. And then, you know, of course, you know, for them, they had like aftershocks for like 30 days afterwards or whatever. But yeah, so I thought you were talking about that one because like we had people on Facebook in Spokane going, oh my God, I just felt that. And we're like, yeah, I'm going checking all my collectibles now, making sure they didn't fly off the shelf. Uh, no, I was talking about the one earthquake we had in Oregon that was like in the 90s. Oh, yeah, no. We get them every now and then here. We had like a two uh, a month or two ago. I didn't feel it. I had no idea it happened, but we get them every tiny ones every now and then over here. So, um, so anything that let's say, I mean, we're, we're in the wrapping up stage anyway. So one, anybody's got a question for Josh, you know, throw it out, let us know. Um, but two, you know, what are the, you know, the biggest things you've had to overcome as a, I mean, because you basically check a whole lot of the check marks. You're, you're unfunded. You are geographically isolated. You're a small team. You know, what's the biggest thing that you have you had to overcome, and how did you go about doing that? Um, probably the biggest thing was. Well, I mean, there's a couple of them. I guess one of them would be first of all when we decided that we were going to go do the education thing as part of it making the successful pitch to people that this wasn't just pie in the sky and that we didn't know what we were doing, that we were actually making a positive statement that education and the normal game industry could go side by side together, which was a harder pitch to make than you would think. But like you said, the ice has been breaking on that and it's not solely our fault. We're just one of many voices in that conversation. But um, yeah. And the other one is uh, overcoming people's perceptions because most people, especially coming from Montana, you know, like I said, we have the novelty, but we also have that situation of all the other software companies in our state are very much, you know, the like uh, business enterprise level software. So we come off as the kitty table, you know, even though that's not what hey, the kitty yeah. table is the fun table. All right. Exactly. That's, exactly. You know, that's what I've been trying to say. But like, you know, so we have to prove to people that we are actually legitimate. We are actually a business. And when people get it, it's amazing. When not, it can be a very big uphill battle. And also, you know, some of the genres we choose to work in, like uh, we've had people straight up tell us that, like, for instance, we had a recent publisher look at Shattered Soul, our fighting game, and they were super nice about it. But they said that, you know, we want you guys to know that your pitch was amazing. The demo looks great for where you're at with the demo. But we're just not sure if we can fit in the fighting game world. We're not sure how to move there. And it is tight and limited. And it's one of those things that we knew going into that genre that, you know, it, it was going to take us a while to find the right relationship and the right publisher. So it wasn't a letdown. It was just a, that's cool. You know, thank you for being honest. But it's, and also with Burst being a rhythm game, we've had other publishers flat out tell us that they're not so sure about rhythm games. Because a lot of them, when you go to them, especially if they're a bigger publisher, they have the idea in their head that, a good rhythm game requires a plastic instrument, which means added expense, which means added risk. And we're like, well, no, ours doesn't have an external special controller. We can modify to, we have, we have a playable on keyboard or a PS4 controller or whatever. And so it doesn't, you know, both of our game ideas don't really fit cookie cutter molds that well. And that means that we have to do that much more backend work to build relationships and find the right people to work with, which in the case of Burst, we are pitching to a publisher right now. I don't know if I, like they've told me I can tell to business contacts that they we were talking to them. I don't know if they want me saying it on air, but we found a publisher that it seems very receptive and we're supposed to be talking with them more later this month, but hopefully getting more going on that front. Yeah. Don't, don't say anything. Less is more. Yeah. <laughs> it's just when in doubt, don't say it. Just yeah. be, be safe. Um, and that's also, and I think that's one of the, you know, things I told you when I, when I first talked to you, fighting games are brutally hard. I mean, because yeah. it's it's one of those that, you know, no one wants to be the first to dive in there. And it's already such a well-defined ecosystem that, yeah, it, it's a it's a tough sell up one cell and down the other. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, you go in, it's like you get the publishers when they're like, when they start poo-pooing all these genres, like, oh, rhythm games don't work. 
oh yeah, well, there's only like 15 years of evidence that, that does prove that, but aside from that point, um, you know, it's, it's one of those that, you know, we always encourage folks when you're putting that pitch package together, there was an episode of the office where they were trying to explain, I should love how I do tangents, where they were trying to explain what um, surplus was to Michael, you know, as the boss. Yeah. He's like, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. That's what you have to do, you know, with, with publishers. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a, you literally have to lay everything on the plate for them. It's like, we're well, doing a, a rhythm game based on, you know, this one and this one, and here's some ideas, but, you know, here's the competition we see in the market. You know, the more homework you can do for them, the easier it gets. Oh, yeah. And one thing I found out too, and I've had other people coach me on this is know who you're pitching to, because some people are very good at, for instance, looking at a pitch prototype like Shattered Soul and extrapolating it in their head and going, oh, okay, so this is what it looks like with rough models, rough assets. Here's what it would look like in my brain if they actually had the budget and time. For other people, you have to make like target art style renders of some characters and stuff and say, and lay it out for them. Because some people are very technical minded and can extrapolate it on their own. Other people are more marketing minded and you have to give it to them in the idea of, well, here's how you would pitch it to your boss or here's how you would pitch it to a potential customer. And it, you have to think like in 20 different directions at the same time. And like you were saying with the rhythm game with Burst, um, and for the record, I wouldn't change all of this stuff for the world. You know, I like the two games we're developing. When we let people play them, they love them, and we get really great feedback, and the feedback has helped us shape both of those projects. But uh, with Burst, you know, we tell people, oh, yeah, you know, we are making a rhythm game that mixes fireworks and science, you know, or fireworks and chemistry, however you want to say it. And we have to be very careful with how we say that because some people just immediately yep. snap to, oh, so you're doing this only for classrooms. And we're like, no, 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 yeah. exactly not, you know. So, I mean, a good rule, I mean, and you hit on it right there. It's like, you know, this is how you would sell it to your boss. That's always the mentality that you want to have. And, and that's just one of those ways that you can make that person's job easier. You know, you're right. Yes. You do have to think in like 20 different directions. You know, and, and, you know, we'll sit down and have, you know, different levels of material for a game because you have to, you know, you got your one pager that's got the, the absolute key facts and a couple of screenshots on there. Then you've got a deck that, you know, it may link to a video or something like that, but that's like for that next little level of someone who is, looks at the one pager and goes, oh, that's pretty cool. I want to learn more. And then you have a deck. And then you have beyond that, you know, the, you know, either a let's play demo or a playable demo or something that somebody can actually get into. But, you know, when we do these things, we like to kind of, you know, build a trail basically, because you do, you, you don't know all the time exactly who you're, is going to be looking at it. You may send it to a producer, but then they hand it over to, you know, the social media guy and say, Hey, what do you, you know, what do you think about this? You never know. So you just, you always have to be, you know, planning ahead. Like you said, that, I mean, that's absolutely great advice there. Yeah. Elevator pitch it within 30 seconds so that you can get them to care past 30 seconds. Exactly. That's fantastic. Excellent. So, I mean, is there anything else that you want to talk about, Josh? I mean, you've got the floor, you know, run with it right now. Uh, we'll put up, we've got your Twitter and twitch channel up there i saw that a second ago um, yeah it's kind of back yeah because uh i like first of all i love how dynamic your guys's community is like i've been trying to follow the chat as close as possible while commenting on my weird wording of saying an earthquake <laughs> was funny but um yeah thank you so much for having me guys and i just love seeing how you guys are dynamic here and like i said just follow us too on twitch youtube twitter we're constantly showing updates to our games and we love people's input on them. We're trying to create more opportunities for people to get hands on with our games. The one problem we have right now is that with both projects, we're really pushing on refining them. So for instance, when we let people play them, we generally have one of our staffers standing right there with them saying, okay, here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. So we don't have like built in tutorials into the games yet or anything. Cause we figured that what save the tutorial for last, you know, when everything else is working the way we want it. But um, 
we're trying to, you know, basically demystify this because so I one thing I've noticed with studios that was always frustrating to me as someone trying to break into the industry is that all these studios are and I understand why, but they're like scared to show a lot of behind the scenes development stuff because you know they're afraid of like stuff like puddle gate where people flipped out over whether or not a puddle was removed from Spider-Man. They're afraid of that internet reaction, which I can totally get and I totally understand. But at the same time, there is people out there that would really learn from this. Because, you know, for instance, when we do game design camps, we'll sometimes pop, you know, a, a projector up and go on YouTube and look up, like, the videos where they do the mocapping for Uncharted and or the level design. Because when Naughty Dog, you know, shows their level design, it's great because they show how it was blocked out with just basic geometry. They tested it until it was fun, and then they put the actual art assets in, like the burning cars and stuff. And so we could show them that, see, this is how you do it. And so we figured that as a studio that that had to be an ethic for us right out of the gate of we needed to be willing to pull the curtain back as much as we can, I mean, except for in times when, you know, a non-disclosure agreement, you know, blocks it. But, you know, pull back the curtain and show what we're learning through the process so that other people can learn from it, too. So that way it's not just about us succeeding. It's about, you know, rising tide raises all ships. Exactly. And people get to, I mean, and it's, it's another one of my, you know, pet peeves. And, I, and I'll be honest, I can generally tell how young or experienced a studio is by how quickly they want me to sign an NDA to hear about their idea. You Used know, to be there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, your idea is fantastic and I know, and it sounds wonderful and I think you'll do great with it, but if you can't execute on it, then it's not gonna, it's, it's not gonna work, you know, anyway. So, um, it, it, we do have to do a good job and there's a lot of people out there, you know, <laughs> also a rising tsunami wipes out all ships. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there's another side of it. You go at, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, all good um but you know we do have to do a good job you know as an industry of sitting back and saying you know i don't necessarily need to hoard you know this thing that i have because there are you know other people out there that could benefit from it you know and and, and you you do move from you know you do raise all the, all the ships that way postmortems are fantastic yeah exactly yeah. well it's one of those things that uh I we did a video on burst on our Twitch that again archived so please everyone go check out all our archive videos but we did a video that it was kind of a remix of a talk that we gave for Montana programmers called the best laid UI where we start off with the flash prototype of burst and then go through our several different unity builds and we say okay we had to get out of our comfort zone and go okay we're going to put this in front of people and just let them eviscerate us and so they we put it in front of people let them play the game and they'd say okay this is what's working this is what's not and we would iterate the game based on their feedback which excuse me we originally had a separate mechanic in burst where you were not only you know blowing up the fireworks and swapping out the elements but you also kept track of how many fireworks you had left and it was kind of an asset management part and mixed in with the rhythm game and through testing we found out that that just wasn't working that was stressing people out it really wasn't fun and it didn't add anything and it didn't really drive home what we wanted so we pulled that out and focused on the parts we actually wanted and it made the game better but if we were all secretive and oh we're only going to show this when it's ready we would have never got that outside info that helped us make it better exactly you know and, and that's where that's one of the benefits I mean, yeah, I mean there's always a flip side of it but you know i i agree and that's why we do our show is because we want to share you know some of this knowledge that you know, sometimes we forget what we have um, and, and pass it on, you know, where we can. So, um, yeah. any other questions? We'll do the last call for questions. Um, and while we're doing that, so upcoming, you know, one, I poorly formatted, but added all of, you know, Josh's information in there with their Twitch channel and, and Twitter and website and Facebook and all the wonderful All things. the goodins. All the goodies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It is this Friday. So this Friday, we're going to have a Yulia. PR director for Tiny Build Games. Um, you know, they're going to be talking about, you know, their evolution from a developer into a publisher and how they go about doing, you know, PR for their titles, especially indie titles, which aren't necessarily all in one nice, pretty little genre together. 
Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to have Martine. Uh, she does business development. She's worked on the publisher side for a while. She's also an indie competition judge. Uh, like I said, if you are interested in having your game mock judged, um, not that we're going to mock it, but eh, it's not we might. Um, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't put it past us, but you know, send us a note through um, through our Discord channel. You know, email me, find us. I would say Twitter's probably like the worst option because I rarely check it. Discord. Uh, and then next Friday we'll have Lauren Carter. Uh, she come. She's getting ready to release her first game, I believe, and it's a narrative fiction game. She comes to the industry via the Royal Air Force. She was a pilot, and then she did some work in television. And so we're going to find out a little bit about her and what she's doing, uh, and all the wonderful things we can learn there. And then the Wednesday after that, look how far I have planned this out. You've got it all planned out. I am, like, killing it right now. Uh, Jean McLean, the executive director of the IGDA. Um, so that's going to be a good one. Jean so McLean? Go through, I mean, uh, Jean McLean? Jen is Jen. The dancing Jean. machine. What's that yes. from? That's, that's from the gong Jen, show. Sorry, I brutalized your name there if you're watching. Um, <laughs> she's going to be on and we're going to talk about, you know, the IGDA and what they do and its benefits and how you can get involved and why you should get involved, all that sort of stuff. And then, you know, back in, you know, October, we're going to have more stuff too. So, you know, we've got a couple of folks that we are, um, that we've got verbal yeses from. We're just waiting to get them uh, signed up. Booked. Signed up. Yep. Which, um, um, really quickly, too, Mom, give me another note. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, once we get our grant in, because we're waiting for the grant, the NSF grant to come in, we'll have money to ship stuff out. We'll ship you guys uh, 10 more keychains that we've made. Like, we were talking about keychains with, you know, Japanese culture earlier and that you guys can give away on your stream, too. I, Excellent. we can do that anyway. I need, because I still, we haven't given all the ones away. Cause you sent me a big old box the first time. Um, we will do that not today because I gotta find out how many I have. But yeah. we've got some to actually give away. I didn't think about that earlier, or I would have done that. But um, oh, and yeah. really quickly, do you have time for like one last anecdote there? Because I, you know, I kind of cracked up when he said mock mock challenge or whatever. Hey, look, I pay Andy a flat rate, so you can talk for as long as you want, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you bastard! So, <laughs> so th this happened earlier this year. If you want to talk about mock, and I won't say the name of the competition because I don't want to publicly slime them because you know I don't see value in that but uh we attended a indie game competition earlier this year where they were just looking for all sorts of games as long as they were somehow portable in format and burst is going to be on playstation vita among other things so we're like you know what, what the hell let's have some fun let's get some feedback and of course you know we you know did the pitches to people and the pitch includes saying okay yeah you know when you hit the buttons correctly you you know a firework blows up yada 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 and the problem is, is that when we showed up there, the judges that they had, it was at a bar, first of all, up, and the judges were already kind of tipsy. And we got our feedback forms, you know, a couple weeks ago, and it said things like, the judges felt that there really needs to be a positive impact that happens in the game when you get a button pressed correctly, like maybe a firework could go off. And we're like, <laughs> what do you think the whole game is? Like, we were like, you did you not see the game? I, I bet you I know what one it was. <laughs> what what one do you think it is? No, I'm not, I'm with you. I'm not gonna say it because I could be All wrong, right. but I've got F a good idea. P P M me, uh, P M me. <laughs> Side yes. note for the Friday show though, it's gonna start a little bit later. Oh yeah, bit yeah, later. yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's gonna be two hours later than normal, so it'll be like starting in half an hour. On yeah. Friday. No, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna out somebody, but I'm. 90 percent sure i know who it was um <laughs> the um what else is are we good is that everything this i, I love how these shows go um I, basically everything on my end as long as like seriously pm me because i want to know if you know lily how long did it take you to make tea it's been like 45 minutes ago did you go and grow the tree and then pick it and then you know boil the water 